are unprecedented risks for warehouse operators and how to survive them. My name is Teresa Garcia. I'm Vice President of Marketing and Sales Support at Roanoke, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Our presentation is scheduled to run for about 50 minutes with an additional 10 minutes for questions and answers, if time allows. And all attendees will receive a link to a recording of this webinar within a couple of days. Throughout the webinar, we encourage you to type your questions into the Q&A panel at the right of your screen. And yeah, thank you, throughout at the right of your screen. I'd also like to take this opportunity to let you know that we will launch a short survey at the conclusion of the webinar. Your import, input is very important and we'd appreciate your feedback. So if you do participate in the survey, you will be entered in a drawing to win a $100 Visa gift card as a show of our appreciation. Okay, about today's presenters. First, we have Rob Reeb of Marwittle, Mincello, and Reeb. Rob is a civil trial lawyer with experience in maritime and transportation law, including intermodal cargo losses, personal injury defense for cases involving property brokers, transportation intermediaries, and equipment owners in major trucking accidents, pleasure boating, and the Jones Act, industrial equipment transportation, marine and inland marine insurance coverage, uh, advice and litigation, including Hall, P&I, Open Marine Cargo Insurance, and Motor Truck Cargo Legal Liability, and Domestic and International Air Carriage. He also advises clients and handles litigation in matters involving personal injury defense and commercial law. Rob also participates in our Trade Risk Review Program, which helps our clients address their legal concerns, including proper documentation, regulatory compliance, and operational exposures. We also have Grant Goldsmith, who's Vice President of National Accounts for Roanoke. And he is a licensed insurance broker and consultant. He has a postgraduate diploma in marine insurance from Lloyd's Maritime Academy and the University of Swansea in Wales. He is also a marine arbitrator and former president of the Houston Maritime Arbitration Association. Grant holds the designation of Certified Risk Manager International and Certified Insurance Counselor and a Certified Transportation Broker. He has a Master of Arts Diploma in Strategic Communication and Leadership from Seton Hall University. He also holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Systems Engineering from the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. Grant has served on active duty and reserve duty for over 25 years with other Patriots and the defense of our nation. Without any further ado, please join me in welcoming Grant and Rob, and I'll turn it over to you, Grant. Thank you, Teresa. Appreciate it. Okay, thanks for joining us today to talk about this, uh, I think, very timely topic of rising inventories and static risk and how we can address these both through a contract review process and an insurance process. Uh, we noticed a rise in inventories uh, through the clients that we assist over the last couple of months, and certainly since the impact of COVID-19 started in March of this year. Uh, that created a knock-on effect of projects that were supposed to be started and logistics that were supposed to move to those projects and, and inventory and goods that were supposed to you know, go to sale at different times, now all of a sudden, we started seeing things held up. So the just-in-time supply chain, which normally only has goods at static risk for 30 days or less, started to build goods at various locations. And many of our, many of our intermediary partners who normally just move cargo were now being asked to warehouse this cargo and to provide warehousing solutions for their customers. So that's why we've seen such an increase of static risk and goods at static risk over the last few months. We see this as a trend that will continue. We also see as we come into the fall and as clients build inventory you know, towards the year end sales due again to the effect of COVID-19 and, and other you know, industry shortages, we believe that people will build their fall inventory sooner 
not relying on just-in-time supply chains. And again, that process of bringing the inventory into intermediary locations, warehouses, and distribution centers sooner in order to make sure that the goods are available on time for the sale period in Q4 will also drive some increase in inventory. So we generally see increasing inventories. We generally see our intermediary partners being asked to address more and more higher values of goods at static risk. Let's go to the next slide. So a, a key example, and, and maybe people on this call have experienced this themselves. You know, we have clients that uh, have traditionally cross-docked cargo, kept cargo for very short periods of time, you know, insured under sort of long-standing policies, programs, and agreements that now all of a sudden have their customers saying, you know, can I have another 30 days? Can I have another 30 days? Can I have another 30 days? And what was, you know, inventories on a dock or in a warehouse of maybe 500,000 in aggregation, now all of a sudden are $10 million in aggregation, $20 million in aggregation. And intermediaries want to be able to tell their clients, yes, we can handle that. Yes, we can store your inventory longer and, you know, deliver it down the road when you need it. Uh, that's a way that many in, uh, intermediaries are making uh, some additional money at a time when maybe the traditional throughput of goods and the flow of goods are down. So our intermediary clients have said, hey, we, we want to pursue this uh, work. We want to do this work. Uh, the problem comes when we start thinking about how we're going to handle that transfer of risk, how we're going to ensure the financial impact of these larger and larger values, particularly when the clients are asking our intermediaries to cover the full value of the goods. So again, we're not on a limitation of liability. We're not in a position to say, we're only going to give you so much per pound if the goods are damaged or destroyed. We're typically being asked to pick up the full value of the goods and sometimes even the sale price of the full value of the goods while they're at static risk. And that is a much different situation than we've been in in the past. Next slide. So just to define what we mean by static risk so that everybody on the call is, is sort of on the page. Static risk for us is property that isn't moving. So most people on the call are in the business primarily of moving cargo. So the cargo is in motion and we look at the underwriting aspects and the risk that affect cargo in motion. And those concerns from an underwriting standpoint are very different from cargo that is at static position where it's not moving and where moreover, it's, it's aggregating. So static risk is cargo that isn't moving. Uh, marine insurance, whether it's a liability or cargo policy, can generally cover a little bit of static risk, but it doesn't like a lot of static risk in terms of values and aggregation, and it really doesn't like goods that are static for long periods of time. That, that's not really the, uh, the, the underwriting appetite and desire of a person who is insuring goods in motion. So as goods aggregate more and more, as we previously discussed, this creates for underwriters this, a choke point where we now have 10 million, 20 million in a single warehouse subject to a single event that can cause a loss of goods that we're perhaps responsible for via a contract or agreement that is very high value, whereas before that we were only responsible for losses at low value. From a global perspective, uh, underwriters that look at warehousing, uh, you would think, uh, you know, they're worried about floods, they're worried about wildfires, they're worried about tornadoes, and they are. But when we look typically back over the last 10 years as to what are the lead causes of loss that have caused the biggest warehouse losses that we've seen, the loss is almost always fire, our age-old friend fire. And so since fire is a covered cause of loss, a covered peril, in just about every insurance policy, really, it's not about, you know, are you coastal? It, that, that's a problem, and we have to address it. But for the most part, underwriters see their age-old friend fire 
burning through a warehouse, doing massive amounts of damage as their common enemy, their common cause of loss. And since no insurance policy is going to exclude fire, really we're, we're talking about, you know, kind of banal risks like fire as a major issue. We don't even have to get into the more complicated discussions of flood, wind, or quake because fire is typically still the most common cause of loss. Catastrophic risks, as we discussed briefly, flood, wind, earth movement, wildfires, they're also part of the risk profile that we have to look at when we have a lot of goods in a single place. That is called cat risk, catastrophic risk within the insurance industry, and where insurers have lots of values in a single location exposed to cat risk. They have to do different modeling for that on their side in order to determine how much risk they should retain, how much risk they should reinsure. And so because of that cat modeling, the process becomes more expensive, the process becomes a longer process of underwriting the risk, and that generally slows things down as we look at static risk, which is different from our expectation of marine insurance, which is generally a quicker underwriting process. This is a slower underwriting process that involves a lot more engineering. Next slide. So what we see with our partners, our intermediary partners, is more and more of this static risk sort of showing up on your plate. We see intermediaries being asked to address higher and higher values of static risk, typically in a contract or agreement, typically coming from a shipper that says, hey, here's what we want you to agree to as our, as our movement partner, as our intermediary partner. Some of these agreements are master service agreements, which then get addendums in, in local service agreements, which change the requirements of the master service agreements. So a lot of this is contract driven, which is why Rob is gonna speak to this topic next. And a lot of this, again, is not in a limitation of liability for you as the intermediary. A lot of it, the requests are, will you cover the full value of my goods? And more and more, we see the duration requested as annual storage versus 90 days or two months or something that's more digestible by a marine underwriter. So we also see problems with traditional you know, limitations of liability. The warehouse receipt that used to be based on weight or other limitations are now not the norm of the warehousing requirements we see, maybe only 25% are still exposed to a limitation of liability. The, the bigger risk is the 75%, which don't have a limitation of liability that are typically requests for full value for the goods and storage. We also see expectations or requests for gratuitous storage or free storage where someone's saying, hey, uh, we know it's going to be with you a little bit longer on your dock or outside or in your warehouse. Can you give me, you know, I need another 30 days. Can we have 30 days of free storage? Can we have 30 days of gratuitous storage? And, and, and with your large client partners, you know, you often want to, you know, avail yourselves to say, sure, you know, we're your, we're your partner. We'll, we'll offer you coverage on that. As Rob will discuss next, the, the issue of gratuitous storage and free storage where there's no agreement in place also means that there's no expectation in place as to how we will answer these claims. And in those cases where there's no agreement in place, the expectation often is the goods were with you, you agreed to store them for free. And so perhaps the claim we're gonna make at the time of the loss, again, is for full value under this, what we're gonna further describe as Bailey risk. So this is sort of setting the stage as to what we see as the trending in the industry with respect to what intermediaries are being asked to do with respect to static risk. And now Rob's going to talk more about the legal basis of these things and why we should be concerned about taking on greater amounts of static risk. All right. Thank you, Grant, and good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, we get to the exciting stuff now, the legal issues. So. The term, uh, I believe, Bailey was mentioned at some point in the presentation, and essentially what we're talking about here is if, if you're listening and you, you've heard that your company is engaging in any of the sort of holding of goods in some way that Grant has just described, uh, then 
uh, you are likely acting, your company is likely acting in the capacity of a bailee. Uh, the, we'll get a little bit further into that concept, but uh, if the goods are still in what we call in transit, if they're moving under a bill of lading, which you've issued as some kind of carrier status or uh, under the bill of lading that you've arranged as a broker, and those goods are still in the process of moving, uh, that is not a Bailey type risk. But once that process has reasonably concluded, and to use the immediate prior example Grant just gave of gratuitous storage, where you're contacted and someone says, can you hold it another 30 days? We, we now know that you have taken the hat off that you were wearing, whatever that was, and you are now acting in the form of a bailee of goods. And what a bailee is, is just simply a person, this is the legal definition, uh, a person who receives physical custody of goods, usually, and as a lawyer, I would say ideally, pursuant to a contract, who is responsible to the owner for their safe return. Now, a bailee, uh, and you acting as a professional, as a, as a you know, um, in a commercial setting, holding goods for a customer, you will definitely have a duty for their safe return. Uh, next slide, please. So many of you, I'm sure, are um, multi-hatted intermediaries where you perform functions as indirect carriers in one form or another, such as uh, as a domestic freight forwarder, perhaps as an NDOCC, perhaps as an indirect air carrier, perhaps you have motor carrier authority, uh, all of the above. Uh, when you're acting in the capacity of a carrier, uh, you, your liability is different from that of a bailee. You are essentially, uh, under just about any regime we look at, strictly liable for the goods with certain exceptions that are very narrow, uh, acts of God, uh, act of the shipper, uh, act of a shipper would be, for instance, a failure by the shipper to pr properly prepare the goods for shipment, you know, packaging, public enemy, um, war, uh, it comes to mind. Uh, and your liability is controlled uh, generally and limited generally through the bill of lading that you issue. Uh, so you, on the one hand, have uh, full responsibility for the goods up to their full actual value unless you have some form of limitation that's been properly uh, uh, put forward with your customer. When does your liability as a carrier end and your liability as a bailee potentially commence? Again, when the transit stops. Uh, we can use the common example of uh, your, your holding goods for a customer for delivery on Monday. They're in your, you cross docked them or the trailer's still on your lot. Friday afternoon, you come back Monday morning and everything's been stolen. Uh, but the intention was to deliver on Monday. Uh, those goods would still be in transit. It would still fall underneath your responsibilities and legal liabilities as a carrier. However, if you arrived on Friday with the goods and the intended delivery was Monday and the customer called and said, I really need you to deliver these. Uh, I'm not even sure when yet, but it's gonna be at least another 30 days. Now you have transformed from a carrier into a bailee. Next slide, please. Often I'm sure you're acting not in any form of a carrier, but as a, a, an intermediary, such as a property broker or uh, an ocean transportation intermediary not issuing an NDOCC bill of lading. And so you're basically acting as the shipper's agent. Um, <clears throat> the, the law for both is generally that you don't have liability in that capacity for cargo loss and damage. Uh, unless, of course, you've assumed that liability by contract. We know, uh, I don't think this is in news to anyone on the phone, that the trend uh, is for your customers to insist uh, on you accepting, even as an intermediary broker, a property broker, for instance, <clears throat> full liability for cargo loss. And this is something 
that you have been confronting and dealing with for years. Uh, that is the current trend and that is going to be a large part of what we talk about today because it's the same issue with the warehousing and the holding of goods, only the ramifications of it are much broader and deeper for you uh, when you enter agreements of that nature. So uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> So if you're acting uh, in the first instance with respect to the goods as a carrier or and or as in some other kind of intermediary, uh, you will now walk into the world of having physical loss and liability, uh, liability for damage to goods, but when you are negligent. So the standard for a bailee for, the, for bailment is one of negligence. Uh, it's a better standard, a more defensible standard than that which is applied to a carrier, uh, but it is a greater liability than you otherwise, otherwise would normally have as an intermediary. Because again, as an intermediary, you don't have, under the law, physical loss and damage liability for goods. Next slide, please. So negligence is simply it's a reasonable person standard. What the courts will look at is has their, it's, it's a failure to behave with the level of care that someone of ordinary prudence would have exercised under the same circumstances. So this can consist of positive actions, but it can also consist of omissions where you have a duty to act. And certainly when you've stepped into the role of physical custody of goods, you have a duty to act with, you know, properly and without negligence toward those goods. Next slide, please. And so when we're looking at the liability of a bailey, of a warehouseman, uh, they're all wearing the same liability uh, hat. That is, you're really looking at a, uh, what's a traditional risk management principle, which is also actually an uh, stated from a pretty old marine case discussing what, how do you assess whether someone has been negligent or not? And it's a, it's a, a weighing and balancing of the risk that's to be avoided by the cost of the avoidance and the frequency of the event that you're looking at and whether that precaution would be effective. So if it's a relatively low cost precaution, that would avoid a large risk. And if that low cost precaution is, uh, in everyone's judgment who's looking at it, effective at reducing the risk of that bad thing happening, then failure to do that thing is going to be considered negligence. So how do we, how do we put that in context? So that's just a general risk management principle that applies in the law of, a, of assessing negligence. So next slide. So when you're in the Bailey setting and you have goods that are physically stored, uh, we've already, the grants already talked a bit about uh, the types of risks you face, but what we see in the lawsuits, we see you know, flooding risks, we see uh, leaking roofs, uh, pilferage, theft, uh, robbery, employee theft. Uh, and then you have at the other end of the scale, really more traditional, easier to assess issues, which are rough handling, and then mysterious disappearance. But in terms of these other risks, the court is going to look at the, the formula I just gave you and foreseeability. You know, how foreseeable is it that this event would occur in the way that it did? Uh, they will look at prior events uh, that are similar in the area or to that specific place. Uh, they will look at, how, you know, for instance, um, uh, with pilferage or theft or employee theft? Has there been any prior event like this? Uh, where is your warehouse location? Is it a, a higher crime area? Um, and what note specific has you, have you ever had goods stolen from you before? Uh, and they'll look at what precautions have you taken to prevent these events from happening? Where do they fall in the level of reasonableness given the foreseeability of it happening at your location? 
what types of goods are you holding? If you're holding relatively low cost, low risk uh, items, or are you holding cell phones and pharmaceuticals? Uh, clearly one is, you know, if I'm holding uh, bricks or lumber, uh, but I'm holding pharmaceuticals, I've got a much different risk profile for theft, as well as for loss, simply physical loss. And the, the, the exposure or the likelihood of a high loss of a high value is uh, going to mandate that you take greater and more expensive precautions to protect those types of goods in your custody. So it is, it is something to be mindful of. You need to be looking at what am I, what kinds of risks am I storing collectively? What's their collective value? What kinds of experiences, loss experiences have I had at this location? Perhaps you've been asked to warehouse something in a totally new location as a convenience to the customer. So you'll have to do your own risk management analysis of what's, what's happening at this location and what types of risks are being aggregated there. Rough handling, mysterious disappearance, really more kind of standard stuff. Rough handling, I'm thinking forklift damage, droppage, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, those are pretty standard. Uh, nothing, I mean, gently, if you, if you fork the goods, if you drop the goods, that's, that's going to be negligence. Um, if you have mysterious disappearance, um, you're likely going to be found liable for that. However, you're going to have insurance issues on that because that's typically excluded. Now, everything I just talked about can be changed completely. Uh, your level of liability, uh, what, what you need to do to take precautions by the contract you may have entered or are about to enter. So more on that in a moment. So next slide, please. So Bailey's can limit their liability. However, they do need to do it in writing. They need to issue some sort of receipt for the goods that references their terms or in contracts. Uh, they need to have some kind of contract that spells out what their liability is, uh, whether there's a limitation on their liability. The bill of lading that was issued for the transit period will not control the liability you may have uh, following the cessation of transit. So that's just something you need to be aware of. Your standard terms and conditions of service may or may not control depending on how they're worded, uh, whether they address storage, um, how the storage uh, um, obligation was taken on and what understanding may have been written down about uh, that new obligation. Um, we uh, also want to touch briefly on, again, gratuitous storage. We suspect that this is happening frequently. And um, that has, is full of peril because it's probably not going to be governed by any writing at all. And even if you are doing it as a favor to your customer, that doesn't mean you won't have liability for physical loss and damage. Uh, while it's gratuitous in the sense that you're not getting uh, specific compensation for the storage, certainly it, it won't be that you don't have liability because it, the, old, the old issue uh, in this would be, was there consideration for your holding of the goods on behalf of the customer? In other words, even though you didn't receive a specific monetary uh, remuneration, the reason you're holding the goods is to the benefit of the client in the hopes of getting additional business or maintaining business. So it's not as if you're a volunteer completely. Uh, you will have Bailey liability uh, if the goods are damaged and likely without a writing full liability. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Grant mentioned risk aggregation. And I wanna speak to that a bit because um, the, again, to draw distinctions between the risks that you take on when you are acting as a, in the role of a carrier or as the, in the role of a broker is a shipment by shipment risk, typically. Unless you own a vessel or aircraft where you have grouped cargo in a hold, and if, if tragedy occurs to that vessel, uh, 
an entire load of cargo could be lost. That type of aggregation is common to vessel owners. But for you as a, say, motor carrier or freight forwarder, uh, your liability is rising and falling on a shipment by shipment, trailer by trailer type uh, engagement. And while that can sometimes be expensive if you have a high value load, it, once you start grouping multiple shipments and holding them, physically holding them, uh, quickly, a shipment by shipment exposure can turn into millions of dollars. And that's the really significant difference uh, that you're taking on when the customers are asking you to hold numbers of shipments for a period of time. So that means you're facing a single risk like fire or a category or catastrophic loss type event uh, that you didn't have. Uh, before taking on that obligation. The other thing to bear in mind is you may have placed yourself in the circumstance where if there is a catastrophic loss to cargo in your possession, you may have disrupted a supply chain that is critically in need of those goods. And your contract or perhaps you're on notice that if that were to occur, you, you might shut a factory down. Now, now you're into a whole nother level of risk that you may not have already had. Next slide, please. Talk a bit about acts of God, which is, again, part of the, the catastrophic risk analysis. Um, <clears throat> it is true that because as a Bailey, your liability is in negligence, an act of God is a defense. However, we need to caution you that it, it's a rarely won defense. It's a very difficult defense to prevail on because you really have to show that you had, there was nothing you could do, nothing reasonably you could do to prevent or mitigate the risk. Um, if we have, for instance, in the case of a hurricane, uh, reasonable notice, um, that a hurricane is inbound uh, and is likely to hit your area. And there were measures that could have been taken to safeguard or prevent flooding uh, and nothing is done. Um, that's a case you'll likely lose. Um, Hurricane Sandy produced quite a number of cases where this was contested and uh, some won, but many didn't. Uh, and, and so it's just be borne in mind that an act of God type peril uh, isn't a slam dunk win. And the other side of that is, and Grant will speak to this, is that typically it's excluded from your standard warehouse liability policy and can only be added specially and usually with limited coverage. So it is a risk that needs to be considered. Uh, again, if you had your carrier hat on, you're only dealing with this on a shipment by shipment basis. But if you could give me the next slide, please. And, and I think I've already spoken to the substance of this slide, but the, the picture is worth a thousand words. Here we have a hurricane, excuse me, a tornado pictured. And a tornado would be a classic example of a true act of God that uh, usually you would prevail on that defense because it, there's usually very little notice of a tornado's uh, uh, path when it might occur or its intensity and no time to take any precautions. So if a tornado wipes your warehouse out, uh, that's a classic act of God case. Hurricanes are more difficult. Uh, and so I just raised that as an issue. Um, as a carrier, you're not usually dealing with acts of God. And typically if it is an event that uh, can be avoided by rerouting, uh, then it's, you know, you just rarely see cases uh, as, as a carrier for act of God. It's really more common in the Bailey environment. Next slide, please. Insurance coverage issues. So if you've now been walking into new or increased Bailey exposure because of what your customers are asking you to do, be aware that your standard bill of lading uh, legal liability coverage doesn't generally cover Bailey liability, uh, nor does your standard coverages as a transportation intermediary, say your E&O or your uh, 
uh, contingent cargo or things like this. Uh, now, policies can sometimes be endorsed to add some form of Bailey legal liability cover, uh, but you better, you know, you need to be sure you're, you have that and it, that it actually matches the obligations you're now taking on. Property policies, which typically only insure your own goods uh, and not the goods of others, uh, are not a good recourse, although there are some exceptions to that that Grant will talk about. Commercial general liability policies, so CGL policies, they will exclude this risk under the care, custody, or control exclusion. So these are all things to be mindful of, will be covered in greater detail by Grant. Next slide, please. So where the rubber really meets the road and, and kind of the central point in this presentation uh, is, is what we're gonna talk about now which is it's all well and good to understand uh, classically what a Bailey is and what their liabilities are. And that's what we've really talked about so far. But your customers are on all fronts demanding enhanced contractual liability in whatever mode you're acting and including they're demanding it if you're taking on warehouse liability. And the demands far exceed what is typically covered under a traditional warehouse legal liability coverage. And the traditional coverage rarely meets the types of obligations that we see now in broad logistics agreements, master services agreements. Uh, I'm sure many of you are either in these or have seen them where you're, you're walking into a general relationship with a customer where you're, you're taking on their entire uh, logistics operations in terms of arranging things and, and anything that is uh, uh, bad that happens to the goods, you're responsible for it, whereas, whereas, whether it's warehousing, uh, whatever hat you're wearing. So these sort of agreements are very significant, as you know, and now with risk aggregation under warehousing, it's a whole nother dimension uh, that increases your risk profile in ways that are even more substantial than when you were just agreeing for liability of specific shipments. Next slide, please. Generally, any policies you currently have in place that might cover these liabilities are going to require uh, that, they're going to exclude, let's put it that way, any liability you've taken on contractually that is outside the policy terms. So the policies will typically ensure you for your standard warehouse agreement or your standard trading terms, if you enter into an express written contract of some kind where you take on liabilities, let's just say full value liability, no limitation of liability, uh, and you also contract out of act of God so that you have liability for it. This, there, there's an extreme example, but there, it's out there. Your insurance policy isn't going to cover that liability. Now, what you can do and should do is specifically before signing the contract, have the contract reviewed by your broker slash underwriter uh, for specific decision on whether they will or will not insure the liability. Now, be mindful that you need to have a response and there needs to be a decision and that the underwriter review is not legal review, and I'm sure they will tell you that. It's just risk assessment and a determination for coverage. Next slide, please. So it's extremely important that you have your own legal review of these contracts prior to writing them, in addition to, excuse me, prior to signing them, in addition to having an underwriter review. And in addition to contract management, you need to be looking at what is the nature of this risk and is the profit expected from the contractual arrangements I'm now entering going to be sufficient to merit those risks in light of what my legal review is saying and in light of what my insurance review has determined. So with that, I'm gonna hand it back to Grant and he'll go over in further detail how that works on the insurance side. Thanks, Rob. So we talked about the enhanced contractual liability, which is the point that, and I think 
concerns most people on this call and, and which concerns us, both from a legal perspective and from an insurance perspective. Once we understand we're in a situation of enhanced contractual liability, and once we've made a determination that we've done whatever negotiation we can to avoid or mitigate, and, and now we have to you know, agree to this enhanced contractual liability, the question becomes, how do we handle this from a financial loss standpoint? Are we able to successfully mitigate our own financial risk by transferring this financial risk to insurance markets vis-a-vis -vis a claim? And the problem or the, 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 the challenges of today's market is reduced capacity. Um, marine underwriters, while they can write static risk and will write it for smaller exposures, typically do, will shy away from any large value aggregation of risk that has to be in storage, let's say, more than 90 days. So what we typically see as the, as the end of the marine underwriter solution is typically 90 days and different underwriters will say, I'm only going to do 2 million, 3 million, 4 million, 5 million. Typically, they're not doing, you know, 20 million, 30 million, 50 million. So that's one issue. Um, the way that we, you know, added this additional storage coverage to a marine policy was through an endorsement to a marine policy. So, so that was an elegant solution. Um, we had it available for a long time. But as the London market, who had a lot of this risk, either on the front side or on the backside, as the London market has gone through a major correction of the marine book over the last year, mainly because many of these books of business were you know, deemed by the Lloyd's Auditing Authority to essentially be insufficiently written, and the Auditing Authority asked the various you know, marine syndicates to kind of you know, clean up these books. So you know, we didn't have catastrophic failure on, on future losses, uh, a lot of the syndicates said, you know, we don't know that we can even, you know, clean up our, our accounts sufficiently to meet the, the Lloyd standard here. And a number of certificates, uh, syndicates that used to write cargo insurance and hence used to write warehousing insurance as an extension have exited the market. So you have reduced capacity in London. And of the syndicates remaining, in a move to get better profitability, you know, one of the first thing a marine underwriter, you know, will walk away from in order to move back to core business operations and traditional underwriting is the extension for static risk. They were willing to do it as an accommodation. They were willing to do it when the market was soft and participation was available. But now that the tables have turned, now that we're in a harder market, now that we're all experiencing the effects of COVID-19 and, and those reductions in overall businesses in every category that reduced the inflow of premium and generally made the loss ratios worse than they were last year, there is a real just total pulling away on the marine side of insurance from static risk. So what they did two years ago, what they did five years ago, they are not going to continue to do going forward. And we are seeing this time and again with clients we work with that the old solution of, hey, just tack that storage onto the marine cargo policy for the transit is no longer an answer. And if it's an answer at all, it's a very limited answer. Because again, the appetite for that has really decreased. Um, so it's in this reduced capacity that you're experiencing as an intermediary and increased demand. And so we have an inverse relationship. Your demand is going up. The market's ability or desire to write it is going down. And we're all seeing enhanced contractual liability. So that's essentially the problem is the market's, marketplace is not ready to respond to what you need it to do. Let's go to the next slide. So it's important to understand that in static risk, you're at the crossroads of what was traditionally a, a property insurance underwriting practice for goods that didn't move for the most part. 
and a marine insurance underwriting practice, where the goods are potentially coming off a marine cargo policy and now need to be someplace else. And so in talking to underwriters who will help you with this risk going forward, they have to ask more property specific questions, uh, focus more on the engineering aspects of the warehouse, the location of the warehouse, the fire protection of the warehouse, uh, what structures are to either side of the warehouse. Uh, property underwriters have traditionally handled this under the acronym COPE, construction, occupancy, protection, and exposure. And that's traditionally how property underwriters have evaluated static property. And by that, I mean the brick and mortar, not necessarily the contents of others. Let's go to the next slide. I use an acronym PLAAD to focus on the primary issues that warehouse underwriters are concerned about in addition to the COPE. They're concerned about what property is in that warehouse at risk. What's the mix of that property? Is there hazmat along with other things? Like what's going on with the property? What's the location of the warehouse? Again, do we have to engage in cat modeling? If we have to engage in cat modeling, that is a longer process to get through. It will probably involve additional premium and the limits that you may be able to buy for the catastrophic perils are probably not going to be as high as the limits you need to insure. And so there's going to be some difference there. Aggregation of values is if I had to just pick one issue that underwriters zero in on more than anything else, it's aggregation. Every underwriter has in the back of their mind a limit of aggregation beyond which they will not consider your risk. They don't publish this like on their webpage. They don't wear it on their sleeve. So in negotiating risk with you know brokers and people that understand the market, it's incumbent upon people in, in the broker side to understand what the market appetite is, particularly with respect to aggregation. And more and more what brokers are having to do in order to be able to achieve the higher limits required by their clients is to layer programs. So it's not just the involvement of one underwriter, it's the involvement of several underwriters, either in a stacking methodology or in a, uh, a sharing mechanism where we, sh we, we share the same limit across four or five people. So there's, there's complex structure on the insurance side going on in order to achieve high values for aggregation. The contracts or agreements, as, as Rob has discussed, and is what's really probably ultimately the, the number one topic in this whole discussion, these contracts and agreements are so important. It will not shock anyone on this call that they are often not well written and often subject to interpretation as to what the intent of the writer is with respect to your assuming you know, additional liability. No two of these agreements are the same. We read them, we don't understand them. We have to go back to the intermediary shipper customer and say, what do you mean by this? What do you mean by that? Is this agreement superseded by a master service agreement? Have we seen that? It, it is so heavily agreement driven that involves, you know, so many people, you know, focusing and concentrating on what the words in that agreement mean in order to speak to whether or not we can financially transfer the risk of these claims to an underwriter. One of the most important people in the discussion is, of course, the underwriter themselves, who is going to have to agree to any enhanced liability. And brokers will tell you that one of the most difficult things to do is to get an underwriter to respond on a contract to say, yes, we agree to this enhanced liability, we will cover this enhanced liability, and we're only going to charge you so much money for this risk. It is extremely difficult to get those answers from underwriters who generally don't do this business and generally don't want this business. They are not going to have a process on their side to review contracts with legal counsel, with a client, and with a broker. And because they don't have a process, these contracts are going to go into silence. They're going to go into a black hole and underwriters are not going to answer in a timely manner. And yet you as an insured, as an intermediary, are probably going to have to sign a contract before you even get an answer 
in writing from an underwriter. And so that's a real problem to this process. Again, lastly, the duration that the goods will stay in static storage is a big factor in how we try to put a price to risk. Next slide. So in finding the right solution, we, we've gone over this, but just to review, there's, there's several options. And let me just start by saying we all throw the term all risk around a lot. People say, I want coverage on an all risk basis. Give me an all risk policy. I still see the words all risk showing up in contracts under what the expectation is. Um, I mean, all risk is not a term the insurance industry typically uses anymore. Uh, there's really no such thing as an all risk policy. Every policy has limitations, has four corners. So we have to be careful when people are saying to us in contracts or agreements, we want our goods covered by you under all risk. My first question is, what does that mean? Because that's not any sort of defined term we can all agree upon. Um, as we look at insuring, again, additional static risk, you know, we have to know what we're insuring it for. Are we only insuring it for liability and can we use a liability product and we don't have to worry about acts of gods and catastrophic exposures? Okay, that's one thing. Um, we have to define what the risk is within the contract, which is why we must understand the contract so that we can then go to the tools. A marine liability policy under warehouse legal liability, under Bailey legal liability, under some form of legal liability may be the right solution. A marine cargo policy, which was covering the goods in motion that allows us to extend these goods on for a period of time may be the right answer. And in large cases where neither of those solutions works, typically where we're just operating straight warehousing for years at a time, a property policy specifically written only to cover the goods of others may be an option if you have a very large warehousing exposure. So where we typically would not use a property policy, occasionally a property policy purpose-built to cover goods of others is, in fact, a way to go to cover this risk. Again, the method we're going to use here it typically hinges on aggregation of values, the agreement that we're trying to comply with, and the duration of the goods in storage. Next slide. So our challenges are, as we've already said, most marine underwriters do not want high-value static risk. They, they will tell you that if you speak to them on the phone. They, they just don't want it. Um, you have to consider the aspects of this acronym, you know, COPLID, to really understand what you need to know about the risk in order to convey it to a broker, to convey it to an underwriter without a good understanding of the aspects of this, ac this acronym. You can't explain to someone what it is you need to ensure and the necessary details that they will ask you for, which then just makes the process of having this discussion that much longer and that much more frustrating. Uh, the underwriting approval process for static risk will take longer than marine insurance for the many reasons we discussed, reviewing a contract, not the least of, of the concerns. Um, different insurers will have different appetites. So you may have an insurer that is great on your containerized cargo great, good rates, everything's flexible, but that insurer may be terrible with respect to static risk. And so you may have to now layer your insurance relationships because you might find it very difficult to have one insurer handle both the transit risk and the storage risk equally well. What we typically see is that there's guys that only want transit, and then there's even a much smaller group of people that say, okay, we'll do the storage, but then the next thing they ask you for is the transit in order to get some balancing to their risk profile. And so now you may have transit for regular things that aren't in storage on one policy, and you may have transit for things that will be in storage on another policy. So it creates a management issue for you as an insured to understand where these various values are going to be reported based on whether or not the thing's going into storage. So it adds complexity. Structuring the insurance for high values and static risk, it just becomes more challenging every day. You know, two years ago, we could buy, 
you know, limits sometimes of daily legal liability, you know, $3 million, $5 million without a lot of information and without a lot of difficulty. That market has become extremely thin. There are very few insurers that want to do, you know, high value, you know, blanket policy, if you will, uh, Bailey legal liability for 10 and $20 million on a cocktail napkins worth of information. They, they just aren't doing it anymore because of the limitations that they are conforming with, you know, on their side as insurers. Next slide. What I see and what I think Rob sees as well is there's, uh, there's often an inverse relationship with respect to the categories of insurance. So a small logistics company that leases space, that does not have a large brick and mortar exposure, that does not have lots of employees, that does not have a fleet of automobiles, typically from a commercial insurance exposure, and by this I mean vanilla, general liability, work comp, auto, your exposure is, is small. And you can go to smaller carriers focused on that business that will write a business owner's policy, a small package policy. And those insurance partners are great for your small business needs. But the minute you tell them, oh, by the way, I'm also involved in complex logistics and I have contracts that need reviewing, you see them say, oh, yeah, we're, we're not a market for that. So the problem with the increase in the sophistication on the logistics side of the business is that you need sophistic advice and sophisticated carriers to handle that. But the knock-on effect is on the other side of your business, what typically would have been the vanilla risk. You have that part of the business now suffering because the logistics piece got more complicated. And as the logistics piece gets more complicated, the insurers on the other part of the business, particularly general liability, get nervous about the complexity of the logistics piece. And they get nervous that a logistics claim that isn't covered under logistics insurance is going to now circle back to general liability and try to become a general liability claim. And we already discussed how the general liability policy won't cover these claims. It doesn't change the fact that your general liability insurer may still be engaged in defense and in expense until they can get off of that claim. And so because there's some friction there with the concern about that, much of the main street market of you know companies that have Super Bowl commercials will not address the logistics industry. And so if you're a smaller logistics company with large medium-sized risk, your problem is that there's a very thin pool of insurance providers that want to do both things right for you. So you either end up outsized in terms of cost in the middle market or you end up underserved by the Main Street market, which doesn't really understand what you do. So that is a huge buying problem for what I'll call, you know, companies that look small on paper with respect to commercial insurance that have, you know, medium-sized, adult-sized logistics risk. And we see that every day. Finally, it, it, we just can't say it enough. The logistics contracts need the combined attention of the intermediary who's being asked to sign this contract and take on the risk, an insurance broker who can help to review insurance requirements and pass those requirements on to an underwriter who we will ultimately seek agreement from, and the legal counsel who hopefully can help us avoid and or mitigate, reduce uh, insurance requests and you know liability requests where we get into these outsized you know, relationships, because if we don't try to, you know, actively push back on that, you know, we as the intermediaries will become as responsible for the goods as the owner of the goods. And it was never the intent for us to be in that position to begin with. And as we've shown here, the insurance solutions, the traditional insurance solutions, don't lend themselves easily to us taking on those roles. Those are outsized roles under what we call enhanced you know, contractual liability that the insurance industry just for the most part is leery to get involved with because it's hard to put a number to that risk. Next slide. 
So in conclusion, we want to leave you with a few risk management recommendations before we take your question. I'm going to take one and four, and Rob is going to speak to two and three. But uh, as my insurance mentor reminded me, avoidance is the first principle of risk management. So wherever we can avoid risk and not agree to it and not take it on, typically while we're negotiating a contract before it's signed, we need to look to avoid as much as possible rather than just agree. Over to you, Rob. Okay, and then um, not to uh, you know beat this drum too strongly, but I, I don't think it can be um, emphasized enough is that a to go to Grant's point of just a moment ago, we, we have smaller companies who likely don't have in-house counsel taking on outsized risks that could be um, terminal uh, to their future if, if there was a catastrophic loss uh, without legal review. And so if you find yourself in the position that you are being asked by your sales side, by, uh, by your company to, you know, review these agreements yourself and you're not a lawyer or you thought, well, I've sent it to my underwriter. Uh, but but you're missing the key element of having your own logistics counsel. Um, I strongly urge you to have these agreements reviewed by counsel in this area. Uh, it's it's so essential that that they be able to explain to you what is it that you are taking on here, and and in tandem with that, and again, before the agreement is signed, um, and in tandem with that, to point three that it also be reviewed by your underwriters for specific decision on whether the risk is acceptable to them under the policy, whether they'll insure it, whether there's additional premium. And both these steps should be completed prior to execution of the contract. The problem is, of course, it takes time for both these elements. And that is not always a luxury you have, but um, if the risk is high enough, uh, we, we, we've got to take the step of, of being cautious enough to know what we're walking into, and whether the risk can be insured and whether the risk is uh, so, something the company should be taking on. Thanks, Rob. Thank you, Grant. Yeah. Finally, you know, once we've done our best to avoid and mitigate, once we've decided on a wording, once we've gotten the uh, agreement, hopefully from the underwriter in writing, uh, uh, via an endorsement, uh, which is really the, the position A, is to have an endorsement uh, for every contract where you agreed to enhance liability. Your policy is, is so endorsed, and so we all have it in writing, and we all know what we agreed to, you know, months later, years later. Uh, we have to track the values because the values, for the most part, will not remain static. And so without a system of tracking, you know, do we had 10 million at risk last month, do we have 20 million at risk this month, and does our policy only have a $10 million limit, or does our policy have a $20 million limit? We, we have to continually track back to aggregation these values at risk so that we don't accidentally end up with in a surge month or you know, at year end, you know, coming up on Black Friday, we don't end up with much more valuation in a small window, 30 to 15 days at risk than we have limit for on the policy. So unlike a lot of renewal processes where we can renew once a year and we can sort of discuss it heavily once a year and walk away, when it comes to warehousing risk where we're taking on enhanced contractual responsibility, that involves a process that probably needs to, you know, happen monthly and in some cases weekly to make sure that we are continuing to properly model what we're at risk for and how we intend to financially transfer that future claim from our balance sheet to an insurer's balance sheet with a level of certainty that allows us to sleep at night. And I will leave it there, and Rob and I will be happy to take your questions.
Do we have any questions in the queue, Teresa? Sorry about that. I was going on without unmuting myself. Um, thank you, uh, Robin Grant. It was a really informative um, presentation. And I would like to remind folks that you can put some your questions into the queue, into the Q&A box to the side there. And uh, meanwhile, while we're waiting on that, I know you guys covered a lot. Did you have any ex other final thoughts you wanted to just leave anybody with? Okay, we'll just um, wait a moment on that. Rob, did you have anything else to add? No, I, uh, I gave my uh, emphasis there in that last slide about- Okay, perfect. The, perfect. Yeah, that mismatch between um, company size and the liabilities they're taking on and the internal resources they may have. So that's a, that's a key yeah. point. Okay, great. So um, we do have a couple of questions here. Uh, one of them is, did the most recent NCBFA terms and conditions of service, uh, do they limit, do they serve to limit Bailey liability? Um, I don't have those in front of me at the moment. Uh, they may, I'll put it that way. Uh, it always depends upon, uh, again, your what other contract you've entered uh, in terms of the holding of goods, uh, because those terms are really not meant to address long-term storage. Uh, they're meant to be stopgap terms and conditions for when you're uh, acting as an intermediary, not necessarily as a, a principal uh, with physical custody. So. Um, uh, my my off the cuff answer to that would be I would not rely upon them for any type of goods and storage long term that you may have taken on uh, apart from uh, the engagement in which you were originally retained relative to that shipment, which is usually as an OTI under those um, types of uh, terms and conditions. Great. Did you have anything to add to that? No, I would just say that okay. I, I agree with what Rob says. Where where we and pro Rob would probably agree, where we typically get into trouble is 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 not under uh, the standard trading condoms type issue. It's it's where we, uh, as the insured, have actively signed a contract saying that we actively agree to enhance liability, and we just haven't thought that all the way through. We haven't reviewed that. We don't understand there's additional cost involved with that. And um, uh, in terms of like, you know, who else needs to know, we, we didn't probably properly discuss that uh, as, as we signed it. And so we end up finding out about it months later, as I'm sure Rob will attest to. And then we're, we're, we're trying to clean it up with limited ability to clean it up. Okay, very good. Um, I have another question here on the U.S.-Mexico border. It's common that carriers drop off and pick up trailers for unloading or loading. Terms and conditions with clients can limit Bailey liability for freight. How can we limit Bailey liability with carriers that drop trailers? Liability with, can you repeat that question? I'm sorry. How, oh, sure. On the border, it's common that carriers drop and pick up drop off and pick up trailers for unloading or loading terms and conditions with clients can help limit Bailey liability for freight. How can we limit Bailey liability with carriers that drop trailers? Um, I think if I understand the question, it's directed toward uh, whether or not you may have liability toward a motor carrier uh, for goods in your possession as a Bailey. I think it depends very much on what's the relationship here. Who, who, who's, who's contracting with whom? Um, I would not typically find uh, my intermediary client having liability toward the motor carrier. Uh, but I think if we want to turn it around is if, is, you know, you must have some kind of broker carrier agreement or agreement in place with the motor carrier to govern uh, who has what liability and on what terms. So, I, I am having difficulty understanding the factual background of that question, but I think the only way you can really do it is if, through some form of agreement. Okay. Uh, I have another question. Seeing, okay, go ahead. 
I'm just saying what I've seen on that and, and majority of my gratuitous storage um, examples, you know, come from our friends on the border where, you know, goods come across and they're in someone's yard for an amount of time before, you know, someone else, you know, picks up the trailer and moves on. And we have this, you know, limited period of gap where it's not under either one carrier or the other carrier's liability. You know, it's on our yard, you know, we're doing the, the customs clearance or whatever. Um, and, you know, there's often not a problem with this. I don't want to overemphasize. There's, there's often not a problem. But um, as, again, we get into greater and greater aggregation under gratuitous storage conditions, uh, and the problem is not a $20,000 problem, but the problem is a $2 million problem, um, the not having a contract or agreement in place, the not having some stated terms uh, to say, here's what we're responsible for you know, during the gap between two transits, makes the risk exposure to the person that owns the yard, the intermediary, vastly increased. So whereas in the past, the exposure was small, we rarely had an issue, we didn't think about it too much, and it's, it's a standard practice in, in many places. Uh, we just have to think about whether or not that's still the right answer as we move forward and we have larger and larger aggregations in this gratuitous storage gap. Okay. Yeah, and I think one more of a question. Oops, go ahead. Teresa, I did a couple of follow-ups. I in the intervening moments, I had a chance to pull up the uh, standard terms, and I, I to go back to the first question, I, I don't believe they are designed uh, to handle uh, your liability as potentially as a bailee. Uh, they really are designed to handle you as agent for the customer in various ways that you may do so, but where you act as an actual carrier or where you take on physical possession of the goods, I think you're really into another area of contractual liability and legal liability. Um, to that Correct. second question, I, I think um, really the liability when you're a Bailey is running to the owner of the goods and not to the motor carrier. And so if you have gratuitous storage, back to our original point, if you have no terms and conditions uh, governing Bailey liability with that customer, and typically your your standard trading terms don't normally address warehousing uh, because that's a different type of function, uh, then you you may have liability to that owner uh, in the event uh, of loss. Now, what liability you might have with the motor carrier, I think, is less obvious unless they're sued as well and they want indemnity from you because they're being blamed for something that happened on your dock. Um, so there's really not going to be any protection other than I'm not, it didn't happen on my dock. That's the type of protection you would have. It would really be factual. Okay. Thank you, Rob. I'm going to take one more here and then we'll wrap it up. I know we're running over. However, these um, some good exchanges here. Um, last question here, are flood, quake, wind and wind normally covered under Bailey liability or warehouse legal liability? I would say from an insurance perspective, uh, no. Um, the, the quotes, the structure of the policies we typically see for Bailey legal liability typically exclude what insurance will call cat perils, flood, wind, quake, uh, sometimes wildfire um, and, and other cat perils like that. The idea back to, as Rob described, you know, sort of the responsibilities of the Bailey under Act of God, uh, following the concept that we may be under a, an existing limitation under our contractual terms, uh, it's not normally offered in the cover. It is normally offered as an enhancement to the cover if you need it, if you are so contractually obligated. And typically, um, the appetite, again, from the underwriter side to provide this coverage is limited. So the problem that we see in insuring it is there may be $10 million at risk, but we may only be able to buy cat perils at a million of the $10 million, subject to a sizable deductible of maybe you know, twenty-five or fifty thousand dollars, or sometimes a percentage deductible. So, even where you can buy it back, it's typically uh, not for perhaps the entire limit you need, and the, the deductibles will be uh, much higher 
than the normal deductibles you've seen. Is is that how you've seen it, Rob? Yeah, and I typically have seen it endorsed. So either in the deck page or, or by specific endorsement, it's it's generally excluded but but added uh, by endorsement because even on the marine side, I see this. Um, the underwriters want to assess that risk if it's going to be any type of extended warehousing period. So where I've seen uh, open cargo policies, for instance, with some warehouse cover, some temporary storage cover, generally that, that form endorsement is going to exclude the cat risks uh, unless there's a specific underwriting analysis of the risks for that location. So um, they, don't, they don't just walk into those risks sight unseen. Okay, very good. Well, thank you again, Rob and Grant, for a, a really good presentation. Lots of good information to disseminate. And um, as you see on the screen, here's the contact information to reach Grant and Rob. And again, I'd like to remind you to please take our survey and you'll be entered into that drawing for the $100 Visa gift card. We thank you for your time and attention today and we, we sure do hope you enjoyed our presentation. And this concludes our webinar for today. We'll see you next time.